So again, thank you. Okay, but why has it been so important for so many people to think that birds cannot think or reason? Why did ethologists from who were dominated by European scientists, but also a lot of American scientists insisted that birds can't think? And it was a very curious question. I think it's because there are so many other things that birds can do that we're like jealous. And so we have to have one thing we do better than them. Pileated woodpeckers and other woodpeckers can hear grubs in the wood. They can slam their faces into the tree to root them out. They don't get headaches. They are excellent at detecting and pulling out their food, something we can't, we have much more trouble and have to use actual technology to hear any insects within wood. Ruby-throated hummingbirds can fly nonstop over the Gulf of Mexico to the Yucatan Peninsula during hurricane season, and they can see colors we can only imagine. We can make visual depictions of what hummingbirds are seeing, but we have no way of showing them except in colors that we perceive, and they're perceiving stuff we can't. Red poles can survive in a chamber when the temperature is set at negative 60 degrees for three hours, naked as jaybirds. The scientists who figured that out, they left each bird that they were studying in the chamber set at that and saw how many minutes they survived and then they were dead. And that was the way science used to go. Ravens thrive in the Arctic winter, can be found on Mount Everest as high as 20,600 feet and also in the desert southwest. Eagle eyes could see an ant on the ground from 10 stories up. Their vision is four to five times more acute than ours and they also see in the ultraviolet spectrum. Northern gannets can dive from over 200 feet above the water, plunging down 36 to 197 feet deep into the water, hitting it at over 100 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour. They don't get any water going up their nose because their nostrils are inside their beak. So they're completely closed to keep out water during dives. They never get the bends. They never have that awful sensation that we do belly flopping. They are so superior to us in that skill. Peregrine falcons can fly over 200 miles per hour in a stoop. They can't grab the duck at that speed. That would break their leg, break their toe off, do all kinds of horrible things. So they keep their toes balled up. And as they pass the duck, they bonk it hard. And then they can slow down. And now the duck isn't trying to get away. It's dead. And so they can grab it in midair. Barn owls can successfully hunt by hearing alone in absolute darkness, the kind of darkness you'd need for a dark room for photography. So birds can do a heck of a lot of things we can't, and they could do the, a lot of the things we can do better than we can. But even in terms of their brain power, many species have way better spatial memories than we mere humans. A black-capped chickadee can cache 100,000 items of food every year and remember where its caches are. A gray jay or Canada jay caches thousands of items every month. California scrub jays not only remember where their food is cached, they remember which food they put into each cache. When one learns 
has, starts pulling out a few wax worms that have gotten spoiled, they stop going to caches that have wax worms. They go to their other caches. How do we test how smart they are? We need to use species that are easily raised in captivity, which is not this orange crowned warbler. We use species we know most about species that we can raise in captivity easily from chickadees and ravens to pigeons and zebra finches. Or it has to be species that can be easily tracked in the wild. Acorn woodpeckers all go back to the same granaries where they've been hiding their acorns so they can be tracked easily. Florida scrub jays have such a small home range and individual birds never leave it. And so they're pretty easy to track. Eastern bluebirds are very faithful to their nest cavities returning year after year. And those can be manipulated because they nest in bird houses. So we can do all kinds of experimental things to, to figure out how they learn, what they do if they lose their house and all kinds of things because they come back. Black capped chickadees, look at the fancy hardware on the chickadee here. He's got the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band. He's got a color band and he's got an RFID chip. So every time that chickadee, which was banded at Cornell, goes into any of their bird feeders or into a birdhouse that they have an RFID chip reader in, they will know exactly when that individual chickadee did whatever it was doing. And so that allows us to learn a whole lot about them. We can track California uh, condors. This is Kodama and uh, she's got number 46 on her and a satellite transmitter so people can keep track of her. This is one of Kevin McGowan's American crows in Ithaca, New York. They all uh, whenever he learns where a crow nest is, he climbs it and uh, bands the babies. You can see the bands on their legs, but he also puts a color patch on the shoulder. The color of the patch tells him what year he put that on. All the ones for each given year have a, a unique color so that he could just look and know what year he banded it. Plus, they also, oh, and what year it was born. And then he puts those letter codes so he can keep track of each individual. He knows who the parents are. He can work out so much information. And he's been doing this for three or four decades. So it's amazing what he's learned about crows in the wild from his Ithaca studies. But we also study bird brains and the birds that we choose for these can't have too many legal protections to study their brains. Uh, this songbird brain is a canary. And you can look at the brain of a canary and a human and our brain has all that folding in the cerebrum. And that's what we used to say prove that we were so smart because we had all this brain folding. And look at that bird brain. It doesn't have any folding. But it turns out that for the size of the brain, birds have as many neurons in that simple brain as primates have. So their brain it, it took scientists a long time to be able to wrap their heads around the possibility that you could have a very intelligent, adaptive, capable of learning brain that looked like a bird brain. We did studies in captivity of um, uh, homing pigeons. Uh, this is one that was actually carrying 
messages, but they did studies of pigeons wearing helmets, not like that one, uh, but just metal, like a, a bicycle helmet type thing uh, with metal in them. And if the metal was magnetic, the birds were fine on sunny days, but on cloudy days, they could not find their way home. If the metal was not magnetic, those birds could find their way home on sunny days too, but they could also find their way home on cloudy days. And that's how we learned that pigeons use magnetism as part of their orientation when they're homing. But they also use the sun when, uh, if the sun is out, they can use that. But if the sun is missing, they resort to magnetism. We've done a lot of captive studies on brains of black-capped chickadees and canaries. Both of these species we know selectively allow a bunch of brain neurons to die out every year at a particular season. In the case of chickadees, it's during late summer. In the case of canaries, it's before their new song period. Black-capped chickadees have memorized every crevice in a birch tree and it might've gotten struck by lightning. And those are wasted space in their brain now, but if they could delete those files on their hard drive, they have room for new files. And so they are growing new neurons every year before they start caching away their food. And uh, with canaries, what they're deleting is last year's song. Female canaries are only attracted by the newest music. And so the males, every year have to have a new song and their brains. Uh, so chickadees are losing their neurons in the part of their brain that scientists have mapped out as the spatial memory part of the brain. Canaries, the neurons they're replacing every year are in the vocalization part of the brain. And so that's what chickadees are doing every, uh, late summer, they start growing new neurons so that they can remember where they're hiding all their food. How do we test how smart birds are? We, for laboratory studies, we have to have a way of measuring different things. And it's usually the same kind of thing that we use for testing dogs or rats. So pigeons, they learn to press a button, um, in a, you know, when they get a certain stimulus, they press the button and then they get rewarded. And if they press it when they have the wrong stimulus, they don't get rewarded or they might even get shocked. And B.F. Skinner did a whole lot of studies on pigeons. He spent his career studying pigeons and thought they were um, smarter than dogs. He thought they were one of the smartest animals comparable to primates. Now, originally I was going to be covering a whole lot of just what other people have studied, but I've had a lot of opportunities in my life to actually be watching individual birds doing cool things. And I decided to make more of my focus on what I know personally, but also tied in with what other people know. But if you really wanna get in depth, cool reading, Jennifer Ackerman's two books, The Genius of Birds and The Bird Way, are absolutely wonderful. She's traveled the world over finding the most prominent animal behaviorists and ornithologists studying bird intelligence. And she's a magnificent writer, and I can't recommend these books high enough. Candace Savage did pretty much the same thing with her book, Bird Brains, and there's a new edition of it that I don't have, but it looks a lot like that. She's studying corvids. And then the things Bernd Heinrich 
writes are really, really fascinating too. He's very focused on obviously his own research. So the other books give you a broader sense of what other scientists are doing. And also, especially with Jennifer Ackerman's books, getting a really good picture of other birds besides corbett's. But I learned everything I knew about animal intelligence from the Mickey Mouse Club show back in the 50s and 60s when every now and then Jiminy Cricket presented the human animal. He sang a song about you are a human animal. You are a very special breed for you are the only animal who can think, who can reason, who can read. And I believed every word Jiminy Cricket said. One of the things he said in one of these was that anything you wanted to know, you could learn from a book. The trick is scientists do not learn what they know from books. They learn, or at least they learn from books, but then they go beyond the books, they ask questions that the books don't have the answers to. So it's actually rather unscientific to think you can learn everything from books. When I started taking care of birds, I started making observations that told me a lot of things Jiminy Cricket taught me were wrong. Um, the very first bird I ever took care of for any length of time was a little blue jay named Ludwig. And that's an actual picture of him. It was from a slide and I didn't have a very good way. It was a crappy picture to begin with and digitizing it made it worse. But I was a teacher when I got Ludwig. And on the last day of school, I came home with my bell that I kept on my desk and I'd ring that bell, and that's the actual bell, I'd ring it when I wanted the kids to be quiet. So I'm unpacking all my, my desk stuff in our apartment and took out the bell and Ludwig was hopping around so I rang the bell and he jolted and jumped back and looked at the bell and cocked his head and I rang it again and he jolted and then he went right up to it and pressed the button. The trick was he was a little blue jay and when he pressed the button, his breast was against it, dampening the sound. So it didn't sound cool like when I rang it. And I rang it again and he tried again and again and he couldn't make it sound good. And Russ and I left the room for a while and when we came and we were watching TV, I think it was the Nightmare Tyler Moore show was on. And all of a sudden we heard this perfect ding ding, 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 ding. And I came running and he was hovering over the bell so he could press it without touching it. There is nothing at all in nature that will help a blue jay if it knows how to ring the bell from a pit game, nothing. But he was curious. It was a kind of play. It was setting up a puzzle that he wanted to figure out the answer to. And he reasoned through that. That's pretty amazing to me. But here's my only other picture of baby Ludwig. And there's the pit game. Um, when I had another blue jay named Sneakers, I brought home some Mexican jumping beans from Arizona for my kids and they were fascinated for all of two or three minutes and then they lost interest and sneakers just could not get over these beans jumping around like he, he or she was just puzzling over it cocking her head and just being so bewildered and I didn't want her to massacre them because they each had a little tiny caterpillar in them so I put them away but when I every time I took them out she just was so fascinated and I gave her a couple of little pieces of wood that she could massacre or a couple of beans and because she wanted to take them apart that was a fundamental 
thing going on in her mind. And um, she never lost interest in those Mexican jumping beans until the little um, guys pupated and then no, cat or, no uh, moths ever came out of them. So I don't know what became of them. But scientists think that they evolved to scare birds away the way they hop, they move around unpredictably. But if blue jays lived in their range, they'd all be extinct because blue jays would wipe out every one. Every now and then this stops working for a moment there. Um, I don't have a picture, but when uh, when Sneakers was a baby and when all the Blue Jays I rehabbed were babies, I'd take them up to a mirror and watch what they did. And it was sort of like Pip when she was a puppy and first saw a reflection in a mirror, she thought it was another puppy and she started barking at it. Um, and I don't know if she ever puzzled together what mirrors are. You don't really know what's going on in their mind, but she loses interest very quickly. And she looks back and forth between herself and me in the mirror. So I think she had an idea what was going on. And here's a re reenactment, but the only little critters I had available to check in the mirror today were mammals. And so I can't show you a bird looking in a mirror but I'm pretty sure blue jays understand that their reflection is themselves because when you hold them up to the mirror glass, they tap on it looking at that little blue jay. Uh, they look back at me and my reflection go back and forth. And it seems like they puzzle it through, but I can't be sure. There's no way I could be sure, but we do know that magpies recognize their reflection in a mirror. And the way we know that is from an ingenious lab study. They marked magpies on their throat with a little bit of red or a little bit of black. The ones that had black, they didn't pay any attention. But the ones that had red, when they saw their reflection, they couldn't reach down and pull it off with their beak. So they had to scratch it off with their leg. But they knew, looking at the mirror, that the spot was on themselves, not on the reflection, or it was on both of them. And that was an ingenious way of showing that magpies recognize themselves. Jiminy Cricket said birds can mimic sounds but don't have language. But several recent studies in the past two decades have established little by little that raven vocalizations do have a syntax, a kind of grammar, all kinds of features that language has. And there's quite a few other birds that almost definitely have a language of sorts, even though we don't necessarily study them. Jiminy Cricket taught us that birds can't read sheet music, so they're not as, they're inferior to us in musical ability. But Irving Berlin couldn't read sheet music. <laughs> he had to use special pianos to play, he could only, uh, just play it by ear, and he only knew how to play anything in the key of F sharp. So if he, the song had to be lower or higher, he had to use the special transposing piano to play it the way he wanted it to be, but he never learned to read sheet music. Birds do mimic though, just like Jiminy Cricket said, but they can have some pretty smart reasons for it. If you're mimicking a hawk, which blue jays are quite good at, that can, uh, they notice that that sound makes other birds do something. It scares them away if they're at a feeder so the blue jay can take it over without having to get into any squabbles. And if they're squawking like a hawk during nesting season, they can flush 
female birds off their nests so the blue jays can find out where those nests are and raid them, which is kind of rude. I also knew of a blue jay. Um, it was a November day and our windows were open up here in Duluth, but all of a sudden I was hearing a baby crow making that ah, ah, instead of the more raspy caw. And November's way too late for baby crows to sound like babies still. And I ran outside looking for the crow and I didn't see any, but I did see one blue jay, but I didn't see the crow. Go back in and I hear ah, ah, again. And I run back out and there's just the blue jay <laughs> looking up and um, and finally, I stayed in the house and watched, and I watched the blue jay make the crow sound. And as soon as I figured it out, uh, and uh, the blue jay stopped doing it. But it was funny because it just seemed to be doing it a kind of play to get a rise out of that person. Mockingbirds, when they mimic every sound they've ever paid attention to, that tells prospective mates and competitors how many situations each bird has survived, how good their memory is, and how much endurance they have uh, that they can sing nonstop for hours. So they're using mimicry uh, to convey a kind of meaning this is Sneakers, the baby blue jay. This is actually how she got her name because she would snuggle against our shoes if we wouldn't put her on our laps. But she learned to mimic me whistling and uh, saying hi and come on, come on. And she, so she learned words and she learned my whistle. And um, that was a pretty cool thing. I think she maybe did it to make, hoping it would call me in. Well, the first time she ever said, hi, come on, Ru I was gone. I was on a trip and Russ heard her and thought it was me. And so I think she might have been doing it because she wanted to hear my voice and I wasn't making it so she could make it or she was hoping it would attract some attention and it got her some attention from Russ anyway. But you never know why she did that. She wasn't answering. Canaries create new songs every year. Uh, those are not mimicry. Those are kind of the opposite of mimicry. They're devising, creating a whole new piece of music. And every single year that a canary is alive, it makes a new song. Brown thrashers have a lot of mimicked sounds within their songs and other mimids do too. Mockingbirds are in their family and catbirds. They add to their repertories throughout their life. Jiminy Cricket said birds can't read and neither can this little kid that Jiminy Cricket was using. But what is reading? Is it leaving something that others can understand when they when they come upon it later. If that's what reading is, dogs do it all the time by lifting their back leg and leaving a message because they can read one another's smells. Birds can't make a no vacancy sign, but several hawks put fresh greenery in their nest. And that may have something of an anti-parasite uh, kind of um, chemical action, but they change it reliably, regularly to keep it green. And it also probably lets other hawks because they uh, often use an, uh, you know, another nest like Merlin's don't build a nest at all. And so, but they'll know that they can't use that nest because there's some green in it and that hawk's gonna go ballistic if it sees it trying to use it. So that little sprig of green may actually be a no vacancy sign. Bees, ants, and ravens can communicate about objects or events that happened 
well before. It's called linguistic displacement. And people think that humans, when they developed linguistic displacement to talk about what we found the day before going that away or things like that, uh, that was a critical event in evolving human language. And ravens are the only other vertebrate that we know about so far that shares this with humans. But we can't feel too superior because ants and bees can do it too. They do it not by writing it down, but by language. Or in the case of bees dancing, or in the case of ants by all kinds of behaviors and trails. Crows have assembly calls when there's an owl. And there is an owl in one of these two trees, but I never did find them. And it's probably lower than my picture is. Um, but they also know how to tell other crows to avoid specific people. And it was some really cool studies on a couple of college campuses that established this. A professor um, discovered that crows seemed to remember him year after year when he went into the nest to um, ban the babies, and they hated him. And it seemed like more crows were yelling at him than, had ever, than he'd ever interacted with. And so he did some studies with the students where they would wear one of two um, masks, uh, Dick Cheney, or I forget what the other one was. And the crows and only the, the students wearing one of the masks were actually banding the babies. And the crows hated anybody wearing that mask, but they, uh, these were like Kevin McGowan's marked crows. So you could tell which crows had been exposed to the mask and which had never been exposed to it, but they all learned it from each other. They have a culture that actually somehow communicated, stay away from anybody wearing that mask. Birds can't do basic math except some of them can. We know that crows can count at least to six. And a couple of scientists think the number may actually be up to 16. Um, and there's all kinds of different cognitive tests that they've done in laboratories to show that. This in my feeder right here is one family of crows, a pair and their four fledglings. They brought off all four fledglings this summer and I got to keep track of them. But the reason six is a very useful number for crows to be able to count up to is because uh, an ideal crow family from their viewpoint, a successful one has four babies and the parents. Oh, and birds can't use tools. And people can do all kinds of wonderful things with tools, except that some birds can. The woodpecker finch of the Galapagos Islands uses little tiny twigs, which it can break down uh, and barbs and things to give it a point to use to pull food out of little crevices. Here's a bunch of birds that all are known to use something as sort of a tool. Um, the green heron can use bread and other edible things as bait. It drops it on the water, it attracts fish, and the heron will grab the fish and eat it. Golden eagles are known to drop hard items on equally hard things to break them open. And there's an old, um, story that the, uh, the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus uh, was killed. He had heard this um, uh, soothsayer, or whatever they called him in ancient Greece, who predicted that he would die when a house fell on him. And so he stayed outdoors. He was terrified of going into a house and it collapsing on him. But he got killed when an eagle dropped a tortoise 
on his shiny bald head, which apparently looked like a nice hard rock. And the eagle wanted to crack open the tortoise, but he cracked poor Eschelus's head. That story may not be quite accurate, but it is accurate that in um, Europe, golden eagles or the, their eagles, it's the same species, drop tortoises to kill them and that makes it easier to eat. But our herring gull also drops hard food items on the ground. They'll drop it on rocks. They'll drop it on the road and wait for a car to go over it. Uh, all kinds of things to crack open their food. Kestrels and harriers and a few other raptors follow trains because as the train goes along, it flushes critters and they follow the edges of fires that are advancing, especially like in a grassland where little things are trying to flee and these guys can grab them more easily. Red-breasted nuthatches use sticky sap or pitch to smear on the outside of their nest cavity. That makes it yucky, sticky. They can just bolt straight in, but uh, snakes and other predators don't want to get all glommed up, so they stay out of their little cavities. The most famous bird for using uh, tools is Betty, the New Caledonian crow. She was given a puzzle. She, her food was in a cylinder with a little handle on it, way down deep in a bigger cylinder. And they would give her a bunch of wires. Some of them were straight and some were shaped like a hook. And it didn't take her long to learn that she had to use a hook shaped one to reach it down into the cylinder to pull up the food cylinder. Then they started just leaving straight wires for her and those didn't work except she figured out how to bend them to make them shaped like a hook so she could use them and in the wild new caledonian crows do use tools uh, the same kind of thing for probing in crevices to get food out hawaiian crows are also very similar and I've made a bunch of other observations about birds that I was seeing up close and personal. They're extremely adaptable. This is two baby brown thrashers I raised. When they were uh, old enough to be fledged, they were loose in my neighborhood and they would come home to our front porch in order to get fed. But the rest of the time they'd explore and they very quickly learned what things to avoid and what things not to so that they came back to me every day until September when they should have migrated and they were inseparable. It was really very sweet, but they would just come to the porch and be really excited when we fed them. But over time, they were only coming once or twice a day. They had figured out on their own all the other kinds of things they could eat. And here's a magnolia warbler that crashed into a window in downtown Duluth and dropped into a, a mud puddle in an alley. And every time it tried clawing its way out, its feet were getting coated and it got so coated with mud that it was like its feet were encased in marbles, which would have been for him like bowling balls. There was no way this little bird could move and the rest of its body was just coated and it was oily mud. And so I had to try and clean it, which was very difficult. And uh, using um, uh, Dawn dishwashing detergent and everything. And when it reached this point, this was the day I first brought it out. Its feathers were still very ratty, but I had a choice to make. The way it was going to be manufacturing the oils it needed to get its feathers uh, waterproofed again was to be exposed to sunlight. So I could keep it in the house and it would have less of the natural oils or I could let it out. Well, 
it had it was free now, but it still would come to me for feedings for a couple of days um, when I had mealworms in my hand. It didn't go to anybody else, and it also learned to be getting. You know, it already knew how to get other food. It was you know on its migration when this happened, but as it uh, day by day, it just got more pristine, and so but then I was, I didn't have a good camera for taking it if it wasn't right in my face, so. But it got totally better, but it adapted so quickly to getting mealworms out of my hand that it thrived. Downy woodpeckers, some of them are so, like, they like company, and if I had uh, mealworms so I could just give it to them, um, they would just sit on my shoulder like a little, and here's an adult cedar waxwing that one of the kids brought me when I was a teacher. It had a sprained wing and it was in our class for several days. And cedar waxwings are flocking birds. So it was any port in a storm. They learned that we were all fine and we would all feed it, but they also know who they are. So even though this bird seemed tame, during the time it was with us, when we released it near some other cedar wax wings in a park, it just flew up to the other birds and that was that. It knew how to live. It just was during the time it needed companionship and there were no other cedar wax wings, it figured out that we would do. And so, yeah, he was pretty popular. When I raised this baby pileated woodpecker, I talked about him last time, Geppetto, we had to train him to be wild, to give him an opportunity to pick up all the life skills he needed. But he was pretty cool as he became more and more independent. Nighthawks are helpless. When they can't fly, they have no way of eating if you don't put the food into their mouth. They have this huge capacious mouth, but their beak is just these two little things. They're hard, but they're really uh, like loose. It's kind of bendy right where they meet. And the sides of the mouth are very soft and fragile. And the tongue is this tiny little flap way in back that is worthless. So they can't, pick up food. I would actually have to put it into their mouths, but within a day or two, adult nighthawks, this is Fred, he was an adult male when I got him, he quickly figured out that I was trying to give him food and he would come running with his mouth open for me to pop it in. And they all figured that out. Uh, when I had a new nighthawk to take care of, they always gravitated to Fred. He became my education bird. His wing was so mangled that he never, it never was repairable. And I had him for many years, but the other nighthawks would just gravitate to him and he would just kind of teach them the ropes. Just, you know, they'd watch how he got food and that's how they would get food. Uh, the poor bird here got hit by a truck and had horrible head injury and lost the other eye. And, um, but yeah, they all gathered around Fred, the little avian angel. Here's Fred here watching for hawks. Uh, he usually sat on this wood right here. But if he saw a peregrine or a red-tailed hawk or another large, potentially dangerous raptor, he ignored bald eagles for some reason. But if he saw a peregrine or a red tail, he'd start going rip, 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 rip. And sometimes I would have missed it if he didn't alert me to it because he could see way higher up than I could. And if it was at all, looking at him or flying low enough, he would just turn around and walk right into his carrier and uh, little by little work his way out. Great gray owls, this is a perfectly wild bird who's emaciated, but not, um, it, you know, it, it got better down at the raptor center, but it was really hungry. And I calmed it down right away 
by bowing my head in front of its face and letting it preen my hair. And I preen the feathers around its face with my fingers. And it very quickly just calmed down. And uh, that makes it easier for them during their time in captivity if they're comfortable, but it doesn't make them tame and want to stay around you when they can actually be free. Hummingbirds are shocking in how well they adapt if they're, um, uh, this one had a sprained wing and my daughter, look how tiny her fingers are, but his feet were, her feet were way too tiny to sit on Katie's fingers. We had to have a twig for her to cling to and she would just sit on it. We'd take it her to uh, a few neighbors had organic gardens with flowers so she could get insects as well as the sugar water we could feed her. And she was just pretty amazing and neighbors would even come. Um, if Jeannie Tonkin's out there, this is your mom. Uh, and the fun thing about holding the stick was the stick was vibrating and felt alive because the hummingbird's heart was beating and it was breathing and that was making the stick vibrate. During bad weather, we had a very, very cold May after a bunch of migrants had arrived. And it was shocking to me how many birds started coming to feeders just for that bad, harsh spring. Uh, this is a Cape May warbler. It was coming to suet. It was coming to jelly. And this one figured out how to hover at my hummingbird feeder to get sugar water, it could only get a few sips. It could only last for about three seconds before it would have to go to one of those twigs in the background to take a rest and then it would do it again. But it was pretty shocking. But as soon as insects started swarming and stuff, they all disappeared. That was just any port in a storm, but they were adaptable enough to figure that out. And the same with scarlet tanagers who never go to feeders except when they absolutely must. And they were terribly sloppy eaters. Do you see how bad my window is? And this little chestnut-sided warbler was seeing warblers coming. This bowl has mealworms in it and it figured out how to get mealworms. This, uh, the same spring, this poor red-breasted nuthatch was go, uh, I put too much grape jelly in a bowl and this poor guy got mired in it, but it knew me because I'd been feeding it mealworms by hand. And so it was perfectly calm as I bathed in. It took hours and probably 40 or 50 baths before I finally got him looking sort of like a red-breasted nut hatch when it wasn't much better than this before it started wanting to go out and I didn't want it to crash into a window from the inside so I let it out and it could preen and it didn't come back all day and I was really worried that I'd let it go prematurely but the next day it was back and you could tell it's him this is actually a little bit of grape jelly stain still but um, that was like two or three days later so jelly belly had survived I've I think that some birds show empathy and altruism. They did a study on rats that made international news. If they stuffed a rat into a tube where it was stuck and the only way out was by letting it out on, on the outside, you had to trip a little thing, rats on the outside would work it out until they figured out how to let that rat go. And any time a rat was in a tube, if another rat saw it, it did everything it could to get it out. But they never played with that little mechanism unless there was a rat in a tube. Well, when I had sneakers, I had a second blue jay named BJ and uh, in a separate cage. At one time, sneakers managed to get out of her cage when I wasn't in my office. And when I came in, she was stuffing mealworms 
into BJ's cage. She must have already eaten her fill, or she possibly did. I have no idea, really. But when I came in, she wasn't eating the mealworms. She was bringing them to BJ. And what was her reward for that? Do they love? We don't know. But you, all you have to do is read an advice column about people in love, and you start wondering what love actually is. And birds are extremely devoted as far as feeding each other, as far as preening each other, if they're uh, blue jays or scrub jays or parrots, they do all kinds of little things that look like love. And it seems like if there is some emotional uh, feeling of well-being that we have when we're doing all the things we need to do to reproduce, that birds may well have the same sort of thing. This is a pair of blue jays, not an adult and a young bird, but uh, the male kept bringing the female. I'm presuming the one holding the peanut is the female who just took it from the other one. Uh, but that, that could be some sexual stereotype that isn't true in the world of blue jays, so we don't know. Canada geese seem to love their families. The young Canada geese often join with their parents, even though the young bird is now five or six or seven or eight years old. It has its own family. It's joining with its parents' flocks during uh, migration. Um, and birds seem to feel a kind of grief. Uh, they have kind of funerals. Um, Though the funerals may, you know, there some birds may actually feel grief. We do know that when a bird, a certain species in captivity lose their mate, that they have physiological changes that are very comparable to the physiological changes humans have when we are grieving. So that's an interesting possibility. But when they gather, at Hawk Ridge, after one blue jay's killed by a sharp shinned hawk, the rest will be screaming for 15, 20 minutes, but all among themselves. They haven't chased the hawk. They're all sitting there screaming. And it seems like they're just talking over, you know, ways they can avoid that same fate. Um, they may be having some reminiscences about the jay. We have no idea what they're talking about. But a lot of our human funerals aren't that grief stricken either. At Cornell, um, when I was there, one of the springs, a mink came and massacred all the Canada goose nests, ate all the eggs. And the geese actually seemed to be grieving. A couple of them managed to start nesting again, but geese do not approve of, of mink. We are so smart, we've trained animals to do our work. But birds have trained us to do some of their work. This chickadee will get my attention until I open the window and uh, feed it because it had me trained. My mother-in-law was trained to keep her bird feeders going. She was filling her own feeders, bringing them all in at night during bear season, meaning any time from spring through fall, she would take the feeders out in the morning and bring them back into her garage at night until she was 93 years old. This humming, not this exact hummingbird, but a female ruby-throated hummingbird trained me or figured out uh, it was coming to my window feeder, and I kept getting yellow jackets coming into it, and they were driving me crazy. And when I put the bee guards on, they were even more determined. I think they're more attracted to the color yellow. So, um, and one day I watched a yellow jacket actually chase my hummingbird, so I pulled out my dirt devil little vacuum cleaner and sucked that 
a wasp out of the, the bird feeder so she could feed. And I did that a couple of times. And then she figured out that she had a servant who would suck out the wasps out of the feeder. And if there was a wasp in the feeder and I didn't notice her hovering at the window, she would actually tap on the glass while she was hovering to get my attention. Birds have figured out how to use people. This is actually um, a science fiction magazine from 1970 when people were trying to create something that could exclude nature and they just couldn't do it because birds and rats and other creatures have figured out how to use us. Uh, Jennifer Ackerman closes her last chapter of the bird way with a last word from a scientist named Matthias Orsoth, who um, believed that corvids such as ravens are at the brink of a cognitive breakthrough. They have been around for millions of years. We humans have existed as a species for at most a hundred thousand, a few hundred thousand years, a flash in the pan. But in the short time of our existence, crows, ravens, and other corvids have learned to use us as a source of food and shelter. If our species were to disappear and corvids lose this resource, there could be selective pressure among them to boost their cognition. Their brains could double or triple in size and with their super efficient signaling and tight packing of neurons, they might become the next big thinkers dominant among animals. Perhaps someday dinosaurs in the form of corvids will dig us up to figure out what happened to us. You never know. Uh, I am closing with this lovely quote from Henry Beston, who wrote The Outermost House. We need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in civilization surveys the creatures through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And therein we err and greatly err, for the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. So thank you so much for coming. This is the end. In January on New Year's Day that night, I'm going to be talking about our birds and what they're up to down in the tropics. In February, I'm going to be talking about owls. So stay safe and well. And if I haven't already put you to sleep, I'll be happy to answer questions. So we can, um, okay. Oh, so, um, Joanne said that Bern Heinrich uh, writes back if you have questions. That sounds cool. And, um, oh, somebody is here from Pueblo, Colorado. And um, so there was one question mm -hmm. way at the beginning from Kathleen. And she wants to, she wanted to know why is bird brain a negative comment? Uh, because people always thought they were stupid. And one of the main reasons is because of that lack of folding, how smooth their brains are compared 
to mammal brains and especially compared to primate brains. But it turns out the folding is just the way mammals evolve to have more intelligence. Birds need to have um, a, a lighter weight head because they're flying. And so the way they solved that problem was to develop more neurons packed into that smaller, smoother space. And it's so cool that people are finally figuring these things out. And I feel guilty right now because I suddenly realized I forgot to talk about Alex, Irene Pepperberg's parrot, who also knew language. Uh, she taught him words in context for items, and he could come up with new words for a novel thing that reminded him in some ways of some other things. He could identify colors and shapes and uh, it was amazing. And for years, for decades of that woman's career, America, well, scientists, period, were poo pooing just about everything she was saying. It was, they thought it was some trick thing like that horse who was actually detecting without his owner even realizing it how many times he it was a clever Hans, the horse who could uh, count. Uh, but it was because the owner was giving him cues without the owner realizing it. But Irene wasn't doing that. And it took so long for people to finally start looking at birds with actual scientific eyes, objectively looking at behaviors and things rather than with our preconceived notions. If love is defined, as a human emotion, of course birds can't feel it. They're not human. But when we start teasing apart what languages, what various things are, if we look at the physiological things we feel when we're grieving and see those in birds, uh, how do we know what's going on in their heads? We don't. But we don't know what's going on in one another's heads either. And so it's really, tri it's unscientific to say birds feel grief because we don't know that for sure. It's unscientific to say they love, but it's equally unscientific to say they don't feel grief or they don't feel love. Oh, he said that kid looked concerned about the pileated. Um, he was clinging, when he was clinging to Tom's shirt, they have very sharp claws. And so it wasn't trying to hurt Tom, but having sharp claws through the thin fabric of a t-shirt was a little unpleasant. So it was much cooler when he stayed in the tree. Uh, the funnest thing about him was he loved sitting on my arm with his head right next to my ear, his beak pointed right next to the ear and his tongue going in all the folds, checking out my ear. He was very gentle, but yeah, it was really cool. We fed him with an eyedropper uh, dipped into a liquefied food because their parents feed them a slurry of their food. They regurgitate it and he would just pump the, um, the eyedropper, that wasn't what was making it come out. It was us squeezing it, but he was doing it the way a real, uh, a wild pileated would be doing it to their real parent. So it was really cool. I uh, treasure that memory perhaps more than anything. Any other questions that I'm missing? Dolores has her hand up. Oh, uh, give her the floor. Uh, yeah. I, I can't find her, but if you can uh, turn on uh, here. She can unmute herself. Yeah, that's there. what I'm trying to get her to do. Dolores, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh. 
and Carolyn. Um, yep. I don't know how to, oh, ask her to unmute. You should okay, be Delores. seeing Dolores yeah, now. Okay, yeah. There this, this is Carrie. Um, for a while, we weren't able to unmute. Um, sorry, I don't have a video. But uh, I was curious to know more about the linguistic displacement uh, of ravens. Uh, Could you talk when, more about that? When one raven finds a new source of food and it comes back to its family and to other ravens it's associating with. The next day, those ravens know exactly where to go for that food, even uh, if that raven didn't go with them. Wow. Isn't that like, like cool? bees dancing at the hive? <laughs> yeah, huh. exactly. Uh, that's what they mean by it, though. Uh, that yeah. you can communicate something important going on somewhere else, usually attached to food. Um, let me see. I'm going to make it so anybody can unmute. The, I don't know how. Hmm. Thanks, Laura. Sure. Okay, I'm going to allow anybody who wants to to unmute yourself if you have a question now. Oh, how do you get the birds to be so trusting of you like that hummingbird? <clears throat> the funny thing is, when birds are in trouble, hummingbirds are incredibly smart. And, you know, a ruby throated hummingbird male weighs one tenth of an ounce. You could mail 10 of them with one postage stamp as long as they stuck together without uh, the weight of any glue. But they're so light, anything can kill a hummingbird. There's records of dragonflies in Minnesota killing a hummingbird. So they have this existential crisis. They can be terrified of everything because anything out there could kill them. Or they could figure, why be scared of anything? When your time is up, your time is up. And in the meantime, just grab for all the gusto you can get. And it takes uh, every hummingbird I've had in captivity has figured out within minutes, if it was an injured hummingbird, it's figured out within usually less than one minute that I hadn't already killed it, so I must not be dangerous. And so they were very trusting. The one out my window, I mean, that was such a leap for it to figure out that it wanted my attention to get the wasps gone. It was pretty amazing and cool. But the captive ones, they, it, and you know, you put them on a stick and they try to fly and fall off and they figure rats, that won't work. But they figure out quickly, so just stay on the stick. And But when we went to the flowers, the funniest thing was how she could communicate, like Lassie uh, showing um, you know, Timmy's parents which well he had fallen down. She was so good at pointing out what flower she wanted us to hold her up again. So then she'd stick out her tongue and be getting little bugs. And it was so cool. Everybody, another, if you have another, a uh, question in the chat, um, is there a correlation to relative size of brains and different birds to their cognitive abilities? Um, they kind of think so. The bird with the largest brain relative to its size is indeed the raven, uh, as far as we know. Um, but Einstein's brain, he left his brain to science, and it was average size. So it's kind of an interesting puzzle because obviously the bigger it is, the more neurons it can hold. But it's um, kind of interesting how birds, because size, um, they, especially body weight, is, is so important 
to their ability to fly, how they can reduce their size and still thrive and be brilliant. <laughs> Uh, Joy Ann lives up in Alaska, and she says the ravens that come behind her house in the evening have a communal roost. You should record them, Joy. <laughs> she knows that they're talking to each other about their day's adventures. And I would bet they are. So any other questions about this or other bird stuff? Everybody's being so quiet. I have it set now so anybody can unmute themselves. Laura, this is Kathy in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Hi. Hi. I have a question. I'm not seeing cardinals coming to my feeders, even though I've bought bags of special food for cardinals. And well, so I'm wondering if bagged food is not preferred over um, bulk food. I have always had my best luck with cardinals, uh, just with straight sunflower seed. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's so weird how cardinals settle in for the winter. Sometimes they're around for uh, the whole year in a yard. I This year, I have three different cardinals. Sometimes I'll have two females. Sometimes I'll have one male. Occasionally, I've had all three at once. And sometimes I just have one or the other female. But they don't come. I don't see them every day. And... I know that my feeders part of their important feeding spots because when they do come, they're very often here at first light or at the very end of the day. And that's where birds go before they go to roost to pig out uh, so they can be digesting as far into the night as they can. And so um, they obviously have other feeders they can visit. There's some yards that have really good tangles of shrubbery, which cardinals love. That's where they sleep. Um, and it's just so tricky to know what they want. Uh, my feeder that they come to the most regularly is just a platform feeder, just one open flat feeder or they like feeding on the ground too, but I can't put any seeds on the ground anymore because we've had rats again this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I wish they were more predictable and that they were functionally literate. So when, <laughs> when the package says that Cardinals love it, the Cardinals will read that and think, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Laura, this is Barb and Hayward. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if anyone in Duluth saw the evening gross peaks like I did earlier in uh, November. In I did not. Um, I saw one evening gross peak this spring, but I haven't had any. Ryan Brady had a bunch in Washburn. Um, and there have been some that flew over Hawk Ridge. So there, there's definitely been evening growth speaks here. I have so many squirrels this year that my box elder trees were totally stripped of any seeds. And that's always been the big flag, eat at Joe's, you know, mm -hmm. here's the box elders because evening growth speaks love box elder seeds. Uh, then they notice the feeders when they come down for the trees. But yeah, I was not lucky this time. Yeah, I had about three or four friends in the area see the evening grow speaks as well as me. So it was interesting that others saw them. Do they just, do they tend to just 
stay further south during the winter? No, they tend to not be here at all. They're a more Western species. And we used to, they used to breed all the way. Minnesota was part of their normal breeding range, Northern Minnesota. And when we first moved here, we would go through often a hundred pounds of sunflower seeds a week because of evening growth speaks. They are like feathered pigs, but they have so declined. It's been heartbreaking watching their decline. Yeah. Carrie yeah. has a question. Um, uh, do you think the finches in my front yard who alarm in a particular way when the neighbor's cat is menacing them have decided on that alarm because it always brings me outside to shoo away the cat? That's possible, but it may be their normal alarm call. And the cool thing, uh, just in the past several years, I've read of several studies, one that was shocked, shocked to learn that squirrels know when birds give a quote all clear sound when a predator is gone and that they react to the alarm call when the predator is there and like the squirrels live out there they learn what they're hearing when a bad or dangerous thing happens, they figure it out. And it's like shocking that we never thought they were smart enough to figure that out. Uh, but a lot of birds have an alarm call that will bring in other birds to mob the, um, the dangerous thing. And um, robins are like evil when they see a little owl they'll draw blood, but they're also calling, that'll bring in blue jays, their squawks will bring in the crows and uh, red-eyed vireos have a call. Uh, Black-capped chickadees have all kinds of naughty words that they say during the presence of a predator. <laughs> and we'll notice that sound too. And so, um, but that is very helpful for Carrie's finches that she knows what the alarm call is and goes out to help. Um, that alarm call uh, could also bring in crows who would, uh, mockingbirds will dive bomb cats. There's all kinds of birds that will. So um, you're just part of the avian community responding to the alarm. Ooh, and Joanne had ravens eating sunflower seeds. Um, oh, uh, uh, that's a really cool question. Greg asked if I, uh, if birds with similar songs or calls confuse each other, like worm-eating warbler and chipping sparrow, and I, it's just very doubt, doubtful. Uh, if you look at the spectrogram, the worm-eating warbler song is so rapid compared to the chipping sparrow song. And our ears, because they're stuck, you know, attached to our human brain, we process information more slowly because we're not flying 35 miles through the forest having to avoid branches. We have to, pro birds have to process visual information much more quickly than us and process auditory information. And the birds that can sing that rapidly can also resolve how rapid it is. I was at one corner once in Delaware, I don't know where, in a beautiful forest, and there was a worm-eating warbler and a chipping sparrow singing simultaneously. And I was so proud that I managed to figure them both out before I looked. Um, but yeah, it's pretty tricky um, for mm -hmm. us, but it's not nearly so tricky for them. Makes you wonder what the birds are thinking about us. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. Uh, Why can't and, they see that? It's so beautiful. Why can't they see that? <laughs> you know. But the cool thing, like black-capped chickadees, 
recognize individuals. We know crows can because of that one study, but my chickadees, when I was feeding them out my office window, I would talk to them. And if I was talking at one of my neighbor's houses in their yard, where one of my chickadees was, it would come down <laughs> looking at me and come very close where if I had mealworms in my pocket, I could have held them up and it would have come immediately. But they don't just land on people's hands until they decide that person is safe. Mm. Hunters sitting up in their blinds, a lot of them bring uh, sunflower seeds to feed the chickadees because it gets boring until a deer shows up. And so I've gotten so many really lovely letters from hunters um, who so enjoy how the chickadees come up there. But if you ban the chickadee, he's going to avoid you or she is for the rest of its life because you're a danger and they can discriminate. So it's almost 8.30, so it's time for me to turn into a pumpkin. But thank you all for coming. Does anyone know how many people were here at the most? Yes, 100. On the dot? Yep. Huh. I, I hope I'm going to have to check to make. Do you know what time that was? Yep, I kept the times too. I'll share it with it. I'll, with it. You know, I'll let you know later. Um, uh, Joanne asked about my secret about raising mealworms. Most of the time I was buying them, except when I was actually rehabbing and going through so many. And then I would raise them in buckets uh, uh, filled with about this much um, oatmeal. And I would throw in some KT Exact hand feeding powder, the kind of thing I was feeding baby woodpeckers or baby siskins, things they had to eat out of a dropper. And uh, that, because I figured it would be adding some of the vitamins that birds needed to be in their food. Um, and I would throw in some apple peels um, or carrot peels for the mealworms to get enough moisture. And, uh, but it was um, just too crazy. So I started buying them in bulk from first a place called Grub Co and then a place called Rainbow Mealworms. And I think both of them are out of business now. So um, I don't know where the best place to buy quantities are now. I just buy small things because I only give them to my chickadees now. Um, and a lot of times I don't even have them for them. So. And um, I have to thank uh, Paula and Lori for, um, Lori was having a power outage today. So I am very, very grateful that uh, you guys helped. And so Paula was doing backup just in case, but yeah. she's been dealing with a big snowstorm in Ohio. So, yeah. but she has a Christmas tree up already. We never put ours up until after my daughter's birthday. And I think the ideal day to put up ornaments is Beethoven's birthday, which is December 16th. So usually the tree goes up around the 11th because Katie's birthday is the 10th and then. <laughs> and and we we'll always get balsam. This is the very first year I've ever had it up for the first of December and my tree is filled with bird ornaments. Wish you could see them. We had to put our Christmas lights up during a um, thaw when it was uh, nice for us to go up on the roof and everything, but we never ever turned them on until the day <laughs> after Thanksgiving, except yeah. that he was just testing them and turned it on right when some children were going past and saying how pretty they looked. So we started putting, uh, so we've been lighting them for weeks now. 
Well, thanks again for another wonderful program, and everybody stay safe. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anywhere. It's a scary time. Um, uh, the, the huge number, it was a record-breaking number again of people dying from the disease today, mm -hmm. but I think that was mainly because uh, the reporting was really low over the holiday weekend, yeah. Yeah. so mm -hmm. I don't think it was quite as horrifying as it looks. Yeah. This is Susan in St. Louis. Hey there, how are you? Hi, Susie. Um, somebody mentioned bird ornaments on trees and it just reminded me of something. Maybe five years or so ago, the next door neighbors moved away and they left some things out on the curb to be picked up by the trash. And one of them was what I call an alpine tree about six feet tall, but very skinny. You know, the little branches only come out maybe a foot, 14 inches wide. And I thought, I'm going to take that. I'm just going to pick that up in the attic and, and hang on to that. And literally two weeks later, a friend from church approached me. He said, my friend's adult son just passed away from cancer. And he was a bird lover and has this, had this whole collection of bird ornaments. And my friend was asking me if I knew anyone who might appreciate those bird ornaments. And she said, I thought of you. So she gave me two shoe boxes full of ceramic bird ornaments that oh, wow. this poor man who had passed away long, be long before his time. So the little skinny, alpine tree that I picked up from the trash became the bird tree. So the first year I put all those bird ornaments and plus a bunch of my own on the tree, I took a picture of it and sent it to Donna so she could send to her friend to show that her son's bird ornaments were in loving hands. How sweet. Yeah. That's so a that wonderful year, story. And helped me decorate the bird tree. So we're going to do that again this year. One of my favorite ornaments, um, they, for a while they had these little kits where you could make these uh, witch ornaments, little uh, cloth Christmas witches. And one of my friends gave her a red hat back during the time when I was always wearing a red hat and made binoculars out of rolled up little bits of electrical tape and uh, something black to put around. And then... Uh, at a craft store, got a tiny wooden blue jay and put it on the red hat. And it was so adorable. So we still, that one comes out every year. I have a bunch of bird ornaments. And all the questions are over and our group is ebbing away, no. but no. I'm still around. There's a few more questions. In Madison, where I actually used to live, there was a black-throated gray warbler this week. That's a Western bird, and no one knows what the heck it's doing in Madison, Wisconsin, but there were a couple <laughs> sightings all the way out on the East Coast this year, and it could be that they were kind of driven away by all the fires, because that's a truly oh. Western bird um, hmm. and, and all the damaged habitat, you know, during and after the fires, things that, you know, I, I mean, there was the strangest stories from the fires. There was a um, an owl, I think it was a Western screech owl, but now I can't remember what species, ended up flying into a helicopter Ooh. that was dealing with the fire. Hmm. And um, and then flew out again later. But it was so oh. scary. That poor bird was up so high because they normally wouldn't be flying that high. They stay within the forest. But mm -hmm. what do you do when the forest is on fire? Yeah. We had a sighting. A, a, several people now have seen a, a rock wren here. Oh, in that's right. Yeah. That's caused quite a stir in Maine. And we had a Bullock's Oriole too, which caused quite a stir. So all kinds of odd things happening. 
Yeah. Choose a season. <laughs> One time a rock wren hopped a freight to Bemidji, Minnesota, a pair of them. And they actually nested, tried to nest, I don't think they fledged the young, in a railroad yard in Bemidji, Minnesota. That was during the 80s. Um, and that's the only rock wren I've seen in Minnesota, but. Yeah, this was only the second one seen in Maine. My first oh. black-throated gray war, but oh, that's right. Uh, what, what year was that, Paula? I don't remember that. <laughs> but uh, that was your birthday. That was I a know. birthday bird. That's was. cool. <laughs> I, I was working and I remember going to somebody's house and I, back when you used to wear, you know, flats and got dressed up to go to work. So here I was, drove from Brexville downtown Cleveland to work. <laughs> uh, that's cool. My coolest birthday lifer was California Condor on 11, 11, 11. Oh, wow. I figured Ooh. out in fifth grade that I was going to turn 60 on 11, 11, 11, which seemed cosmic because how many ones are in 11, 11, 11? Uh, um, yeah. And so my whole life, I wanted to do something really cool on my 60th birthday. So Russ and I went down to the Grand Canyon. Nice. And that's where I saw my lifer. It is so cool that all these people came. It's such a a, a weird thing because I when I started talking about birds, I literally could not get a word out until the lights were out. Everybody's looking at the slide projector, and I was in the back of the room, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was very stressful. But I'm starting to adapt in my dotage. You don't come across as nervous at all. It's really funny. I'm not, I mean, you, yeah. I'm not anymore, and I don't yeah. know why, but I guess yeah. it's because everybody's so nice. <laughs> well, you know your topic so well, and you tell, you're, you're a good storyteller. That's what makes, I think it makes you really special, Laura, is that not only do you have incredible knowledge, but the, the knowledge comes out as a story instead of a lecture. It makes a big difference. I, I was worried about this topic because there's so much cool research um, yes. and so much cool technical stuff. But I figured I really have had some, I've been so lucky in my life to have had a pileated woodpecker French kissing my ear. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, and my the Blue Jays, I just learned so many cool things from them um, about instinct versus learning. Like I had this little helicopter toy that came in Rice Krispies and <laughs> it had a little spiral stick and something with a rubber band. You pulled something and the little helicopter yeah. thing went around the room. Yeah. And when I would do that, when I had Ludwig, he would grab it in midair and bring it back <laughs> to me he was playing fetch <laughs> and then we were doing it out in the backyard and one time it landed on our roof and when he landed to get it that instant he keeled over on his side spread out his wings his mouth open and he just looked like he was dying and he was up on the roof so it was only a uh two and a half story building. So I, and we were in the basement apartment and I knew where the landlord had a ladder. So I went in and grabbed the ladder and started climbing up, get on the roof. And right as I got close to him, he just kind of shook his head, perked up and flew off. And then he came back and grabbed the helicopter and flew off again. Huh. And that was the first I'd ever observed sunning. Mm. It's what birds right. do. They open all their feathers and expose themselves to ultraviolet light. And if they do it too spontaneously like that, they can easily get eaten by a predator if they're out in the open. Uh, this summer, I got a picture of a robin doing it right next to our raspberry patch. I'd watched him take a bath 
And then he flew in and on the ground next to the raspberry patch in a nice big bop of sunlight, he opened his wings. And that, uh, if, it, if it overheats, the mites raises the skin temperature above the normal skin temperature, they'll um, jump ship. So oh, that's me. Any more questions before I just, oh, the other cool thing about Ludwig though, uh, we were in the basement apartment and every now and then ants would come in a window. And when, when there was a fly in the apartment, he would just chase it until he finally caught it and he'd, you know, peck it and eat it. Um, with the ants, the first time he picked up an ant, he picked it up, had it in his beak, and you could watch his tongue rub against it. And all of a sudden his crest went up. He spit it out and just jumped back looking so alarmed. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he went and, and he was just looking like so annoyed. And then all of a sudden he like cocked his head a little bit, picked it up again and started smearing it on his feathers. Oh my gosh. And that's called anting. Uh, active anting when you're actually, uh, you know, smearing it. And um, it was clearly the bitter taste that shocked him first, but then all of a sudden he thought he was supposed to do something with that. So he and he was, oh. he was a young one that had not learned that before he came to your house. Right, exactly. That's amazing. Huh. So, yeah, I got to see the very first time he sunned and the very first time he anted. There's another kind of anting called passive anting, where you're on the anthill, usually in the same pose as for sunning, only you're letting the ants crawl through your feathers. And their bodies are laced with formic acid. And right. so it leaves that bitterness on the feathers, which probably works as good as deep woods off or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so did he ever eat ants? No. 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 Uh, with Too ants, bitter. it was just, yeah. Um, uh, flickers eat ants as mm. well as using yes. them for anting. Uh, pileated woodpeckers eat ants, but there aren't very many birds who do because of that bitter taste. And that's why ants walk along the sidewalks and nobody goes around eating them. Oh, right. Uh, they can be very conspicuous, but that bitter taste protects them from most predators. Uh huh. Fascinating. Yeah, I was going to leave earlier, and I'm so glad I stuck around. <laughs> Good to the uh, last my husband said I've my, learned. <laughs> yeah, Russ said, my tombstone will read, she blathered about birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and everybody listened. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But, um, but I suppose I should go downstairs. I have to eat some dinner now. I Ooh. am so glad that I stuck around, Sam. This has been wonderful. Oh, yes. Thank you Debbie. so much. <laughs> thank you all for coming and sticking it out. And, thank uh, you. <laughs> night all. Good yeah, night. Nice tummy rub. Good night. <laughs> okay. Night, everybody. Good night. Good night.